Good afternoon. Hope everybody had a nice lunch. I'm uh, the guy up there with no picture, Gerald Groden. Okay, but I'll first introduce my co-moderator, Farooq Jaffer. He's the director of CTO interventions at uh, the Mass General Hospital, Harvard Medical School. He's also associate professor uh, at, uh, at Harvard Medical School, and we are very uh, honored and happy to have you, Farouk. I'm the other moderator, Jerry Groden. I do interventional cardiology at the Dallas VA. I'm an associate professor at UT Southwestern in Dallas. Uh, our panel, so I wanna start with Mauricio, uh, Professor Mauricio Cohen. Uh, he's the director of the Structural Interventional Program at the Cleveland Clinic in Miami, Florida. Uh, previously the cath lab director at the University of Miami Miller School of Medicine professor of medicine from that institution. As an aside, he has more than 200 publications. It's probably 300 by now, Mauricio, I don't know. But we are pleased to have you. Faisal Latif, Faisal, uh, interventionalist and, and clinical associate professor of medicine at the University of Oklahoma, just north of here. Uh, we have also, is Constantinos here? Const Constantios? Constantios? Marma Giocolis, okay, forgive my, uh, my uh, mispronouncing your last name. He's an interventional cardiologist at the Tampa Heart Hospital in Florida, associate professor of medicine at the University of South Florida. And, uh, and then um, last but not least, who just got here uh, on the airplane is uh, Saroj Nupane, and he's from Wake Med Hospital Raleigh, North Carolina, his uh, particular interest is complex PCIs and CTOs. We will start with the first case. Um, uh, and I'd like to call forward Dr. Emmanuel Olduwari from the Medway Maritime Hospital in Kent, UK. Is he here? Not here. Okay, we'll move on. Um, number two is uh, PTCA of left main. Do we have um, Professor Rajiv Bardwag? Yes, Professor Bardwag is the head of cardiology at the MM Institute of Medical Science and Research all the way from India. We are honored to have you. And he will present PTCA of left main and left circumflex in a patient with anomalous origin left coronary artery from the right coronary sinus. It's perfect timing in some ways. So we're starting at 1.35. Hopefully we'll get everybody on time and finished. I have nothing to disclose. My patient was 59 years male, known case of hypertension, diabetes, and coronary artery disease. He had his PTCA with stent to right coronary artery in 2011. He presented now with angina on exertion class three for two months. Coronary angio was done, which showed it was very difficult. We could not find left coronary artery for a long time. Then we did right coronary angiography and found that left coronary was arising near to the origin of right coronary. So arising from the right coronary sinus with castor ping-ponging between the right coronary as well as left coronary. Left main had osteostenosis as we were just hooking it, the BP was falling from 170 to 70. Left circumflex shows 90% stenosis at the origin of OM1 and 70% after OM2, but OM, after the OM2, it was a small vessel. Right coronary shows 70% stenosis at the ostium and there was diffuse ISR in proximal part, maximum 90%, diffuse ISR in distal part, maximum 95%. So this is the origin of left coronary artery, which is arising from the right sinus, and right coronary is just near to this. Right coronary artery, there is osteostenosis, then long ISR diffuse, So clinical challenge was ectopic origin of the left coronary from the right sinus, and the origin was very close. So as we were putting one 
guiding Catherine, the left main, it was in between shifting to left and right. So that was the problem. Osteosynthesis, both had osteosynthesis, and when we were hooking any artery, there was a damping of the pressure. And there was a diffuse ISR of the right coronary artery long. So first we, we then decided, because the castor was not being stable, we decided to hook both the coronary arteries from the different guiding castors. Filter was, wire was passed in the right coronary artery and BMW in the left circumflex from the left main. Then in the right coronary artery initially, we did tandem dilatations with the 2 into 15 mm balloon. Then at the ostium, there are significant stenosis in the middle part. And as we were, we were dilating it, the dog bone effect was there. It was not dilating in the mid part. Then we took OPN balloon and dilated it at 35 atmosphere, and then it could give way. So this is the result after the dilatation of the RC. So in the distal part, 2.75 into 40 mm stent was placed. This is the result after the distal stent. Now we didn't place proximal stent at this stage because the left main was very close. And if the stent came was just outside the ostium and it could, we could have difficulty in putting the stent in the left main. So we decided to put a stent in the left main first dilated the left circumflex. Then dilated the ostium of the left main. Then put a stent in the left circumflex artery. And now put a stent in the left main ostium. This is the result after the dilatation of the stenting of the left main and the circumflex. Then we stented the RCA from the ostium. This is again radial stenosis there. Then post dilatation with the NC balloon. And this is the final result in RCA. So on follow up, symptoms relieved. Discharged after two days. Follow up after four, five months, patient is symptom free. So origin of coronary sinus, coronary artery from the opposite sinus is a rare anomaly seen in 0.3 to 1.6 percent of the cases. Course of the artery may rarely be between the pulmonary artery and the aorta, and in this situation, there there can be instances of this sudden cardiac death, especially in children or patients less than 30 years of age. It is the second most common cause of sudden cardiac death in young athletes. Due to the abnormal course and angulations, these arteries are at increased risk of atherosclerosis. So learning point, left coronary artery origin from right coronary sinus is a rare anomaly. PTC is challenging when ostia of both the arteries are side by side, especially when both have osteosynosis. Two guiding castors are preferable. Long ISR has its own challenges, and OPN balloon is useful when lesion is not giving way with NC balloon. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bhardwaj. Um, any questions from the audience? Well, we're just going to move along pretty quickly, but um, did you um, have any sense of the uh, anomalous uh, left coronary artery's course? Did you think it was anterior to the pulmonary artery, and do you routinely look at uh, Yeah, but essentially it is shown that the, the course is not that important because they say pulmonary artery pressure is not very high. So it is the cause of certain cardiac death in younger patients, not in the adults. And secondly, this patient was having severe angina, and we did not know that at that time that patient had anomalous origin. Though it, previous uh, standing had been done in the outside hospital, they had not mentioned anything about the left coronary artery. 
whether they have to hook it or not, they did it in acute MI and they did not mention anything what happened to left. So we didn't know that this was an anomaly arising. And when we were able, not able to find left coronary artery, we switched on to right and then we found that it was arising from the upper sinus. Thanks so much. Our next presentation will be uh, Dr. Ahmed El Sayed, Interventional Fellow at the National Heart Institute in Kisana in Egypt. Uh, thank you for coming all this way. And you are going to talk to us about El Sayed coronary Lima versus Native. Uh, thank you so much. I feel betrayed because I have just ate a lot in the lunch, so I feel very full <laughs> to be presenting my case. Um, first of all, I would like to thank the panelists and my fellow colleagues for their time for the upcoming five minutes. In order to be very quick, I'm going to be presenting my case today on the Lima versus Native in acute coronary syndrome patient. Can we just reset the timer to five minutes here? It's just at three, thanks. Thank you so much. Uh, here are my disclosures. There is no conflict of interest. And my case for today is going to be about a 67 years old gentleman. Uh, he is a heavy smoker. He has no history of being diabetic or hypertensive. Uh, he underwent cabbage six years ago or eight years ago and with a history of three grafts without any documentation of where the grafts are implanted. Uh, the patient presented to our emergency room complaining of typical chest pain that has been there for almost five hours. His vital data is borderline. His blood pressure is almost 100 over 60. He is a little bit tachypneic with his respiratory rate almost 20 cycles per minute. His ECG showed him to be an anterior STEMI with ST segment elevation in all the chest leads. Um, yeah. Uh, unfortunately, at this time, when the patient presented, we were occupied in the cath lab. Uh, so the emergency room team decided to give him lytic therapy. Uh, because uh, he was in the window. He presented only five hours after the chest pain, so we went with the thrombolytic therapy. Uh, after 90 minutes, the patient declared to be failed to revascularize his LED, and then we were uh, empty right now in the cath lab, with the cath lab team being available, so we have transferred him immediately to the cath lab. Um, unfortunately, again, the patient had left upper limb deformity, so we couldn't be able to go radial, so we went with six French catheter right femoral, and we used Jotkin left four and Jotkin right three and a half. Uh, and here is his coronary angiography. Uh, it should be playing, shall I? Yeah. As you can all see, we do have a proximal subtotal LED occlusion. We do have a distal or mid to distal LED total occlusion, which appears to be containing thrombus. And we do have a total obtuse marginal branch and uh, the RCA is uh, proximal total with retrograde filling from the lift system. And here we need to think how we are going to be dealing with this patient. We do have two main questions here. This patient is anterior STEMI who has received lytic therapy. And for sure here we do have the lima totally occluded and this graft uh, which goes nicely over the obtuse marginal is patent. So we do have occluded lima which appears to be containing thrombus. We do have proximal subtotal LED and mid-total LED that shows thrombus. So the two main questions, which artery is the culprit? Is it the lima or is it the LED? And which lesion is the target? Is it the proximal LED, which was just revascularized partially due to the latex therapy, or the distal total one? And uh, we thought about it, and our decision was go with the native vessels. Our first plan was to revascularize the proximal LED because uh, in the first place, the distal lesion was very distal. And as you all could notice, uh, that the lima was uh, implanted very distally. And uh, we believe that the results in the LED is gonna be much better. So here we go. We wired the LED in the distal side. You can find that we have crossed uh, the distal total lesion and in the lateral view, it is evident that we are uh, distally in a uh, septal branch, not in the LED itself. So rewiring it, we went all the way through back up to the lima. So we now uh, are sure that it's not CTO or it's not coronically occluded. So we decided to prepare uh, the proximal lesion and then stent it. And here you can see pre-dilatation. And then we use a 3.5 40, uh, 43 stent 
نمسك بروكسيمال ال اي دي and you all can see that it's under deployed when it's expanding but we thought again with this thrombus burden it's going to be very risky to develop no reflow if we uh, went for optimization so we just took a coronary angiography as you are going to see this moment yes here and here we can recognize something the first thing is that we have a proximal yes open stent timis reflow and we can see this competitive flow going up back partially to the lima and the distal led is still totally occluded And we thought, why not to take a few seconds and think back in the patient what we are going to do next. And unluckily, the patient didn't give us this few seconds because the patient suddenly collapsed and arrested. After four minutes of continuous CPR, the patient regained his full consciousness. And so we thought that might be the proximal LED lesion got again totally occluded because of the underdeployed stent. So we performed again a coronary angiography, and here was the results. The proximal LED is still open. But the competitive flow, which was partially in the lima, is now gone. And uh, the, the circus has no uh, compromisation. And so the decision was now, since we had water stent in the proximal LED, why not to fix the distal LED? And we guessed uh, that the site of anastomosis between the lima and LED could be the problem. So we went wiring all through. Now you can see it running all the way to the apex of the LED. And we have prepared the lesion at the site of anastomosis. And we prepared the lesion and deployed a stent. As you are going to be seeing shortly, making sure that we are not uh, subintimal. Timmy 1 to 2 flow. And stenting. Yes. And from the deployment of the stent, you are going to be able to notice how tight was there a lesion there. Yes, look at the deployment of the stunt. It's taking a while. And our final result is going to be, yes, this one. You can all notice, yes, that the lima all the way up, uh, up to its origin is patent and they're receiving competitive flow. And here comes one um, petty trick in our case that we didn't use graft stent to, uh, to stent the anastomotic side. Unfortunately, it was not available at Hawk in our center. So our future plan to the patients was the patient by this time has received a huge amount of contrast. So we said, why not? The patient is stable right now. His blood pressure is okay. Why not to admit in the cardiac care unit and then reassess the patient afterwards and plan to get him a graft stent and then finalize the case. Um, so everything went fine. The patient was discharged home three days after. He was doing very well. And our take home message is that you need to be very accurate and very precise and have a plan when you are managing an STEMI patient. And uh, you need to be very quick responsive to the acute situations that might emerge in STEMI cases. And that's it. Thank you so much and sorry for being taking too long. Thank you. Thank you. Questions? Great, thank you so much. Really um, interesting um, presentation. Um, I'd love to open it up to our panel. Um, uh, if they have any questions for you or any comments, um, uh, please. Was this a recent cabbage? Was this a suture issue? It was eight years ago. And not the, the anastomotic side, it was not a suture issue. It was just a, a new lesion. Our best assumption was that the proximal LED was the reason for new anterior STEMI. But the real situation was that the distal lesion was the true site of complication or, or the true site of occlusion. And its occlusion has led to retrograde thrombi forming along the lima and the proximal LED. But we unfortunately, we real, realized it retrogradely after the patient arrested. And you still had a right radial access available, but you wanted to go left radial because of the lima? Exactly. That's why you chose yes. to go femoral because exactly. it was a post-lyric, post-thrombolytic case. Yes. Okay. Yes. Another another interesting question. In hindsight, um, do you think that the culprit? I, I know you fixed the proximal mid LED, but ultimately, what do you think the culprit was in this case? Uh, it's a very good question. Thank you for it. But uh, I believe it's really deceiving for us uh, because there is a, a, a proximal thrombi at the lima, and it's not justified even so far, even with this occlusion. My best assumption is it is a mid to distal LED lesion. It was. Uh, it most probably could be the the culprit lesion. Do you think that, um, you know, it's always tricky. The lemas are, they're so resistant to atherosclerosis. It's such a beautiful graft. Yes. 
And you probably noticed after you completed the case how beautiful it looked yeah. to the point where you're actually thinking of how do I close it off now because it's competing with my native. So, so um, you know, perhaps that, that distal lesion was native plaque progression. That's usually the most causes of problems after a thelema can be patent beautifully, but distal to it. Exactly. Plaque progression can cause new sources of ACS. But um, it's, in hindsight, you wonder if um, that was actually the culprit. The final result's beautiful, but... Um, you wonder if you had actually attempted the LAD, if you'd revast the primary STEMI part first. Yes. Is probably where the culprit was. And yeah. then you still have a choice to make between what do you do with the inflow for fixing it. Um, just on that point, like, uh, do, yeah. you, do you ever use coils? Oh, please finish. You have yeah. a comment. Um, I, I would like to thank you for the explanation. That is a horrible challenge in the case. Uh, it was like, I will not call it a mess up, but we think proximally. Uh, prior to distally, while the distal was the real issue that we are having here. We believe that it's really distal. It couldn't lead the patient to arrest. So we thought, okay, the proximal one should be the, the culprit. So we went with the proximal one. But as, as you have me mentioning, the, the distal one was the lesion. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you. Sir, for taking we'll move on. Thank you, Dr. El Sayed. Uh, our next presentation is by uh, Dr. Mohammed Alam an interventional consultant at the National Heart Institute of Egypt. Welcome to Texas. And um, his uh, presentation is uh, about a complication, antagonizing, difficult complication, how to deal. Yeah. Thank you, Vipa. Sorry. Can we reset the time there, please? Thank you, everyone. Uh, our case today was about an antagonizing complications and how to deal. Our case today was about male patient, 73 years old, known to be hypertensive and heavy smoker. The patient complaining of agonizing retrosternal chest pain at home and collapsing and arrested just when arrival in ER with pulseless VT. Resuscitation was done for 12 minutes and mechanical ventilation and ECG post arrest shows anterior STEMI with frequent attacks of sustained VT, which receives multiple DC shocks and medications. Our uh, emergent coronary angiography shows multiple tight calcific thrombotic lesions in LAD and proximal lesion in LCX and diseased atherosclerotic RCA. Our decision was to perform a primary PCI to multiple tight thrombotic lesions in LAD with multiple drug eluting stents. We use a guiding catheter XB and soft wire and pre-dilatation balloon with a semi-compliant balloon and then PCI with DS3 drug eluting stents. The first one mid to distal LED and the mid segment LED. Then when we optimize the stent for the proximal LED, we show a perforation at the distal stent. So, we implant the, the proximal stent and use its balloon to perform prolonged balloon inflation. Now, we are facing a type 3 perforation with, which is extravasation through a frank perforation. So we use an algorithm to treat it. Uh, the universal algorithm for coronary perforation shows inflate the balloon to occlude the vessel, then IV fluids and pressors, precardiosynthesis was done if, uh, if hypotension occurs and then notify a surgeon. If persistent extravasation shows, we, treat, we must to treat a cause. If it's large vessel perforation, such as our case, we must use a covered stent if prolonged balloon inflation is failed. And if it's distal vessel perforation, we can embolize it or use a covered stent over a branch origin. If continued extravasation occur, now we can use, uh, we can reverse the anticoagulation. During prolonged balloon inflation in our case, Unfortunately, the patient arrested. So we deflate the balloon and perform a CPR for 14 minutes, tear restoration of spontaneous circulation, and perform an angiography, which shows no reflow at whole LED. Now we are facing the two antagonizing complications, perforation and no reflow. If we treat the no reflow, the perforation will open again, and if we leave the no reflow, the patient may be arrested again. So we deal with a, a no reflow, 
as it has low thrombus burden, we use it, uh, we treat it medically by adenosine, calcium channel blockers, and adrenaline to restore the flow in LED. And now we use a covered stent to uh, close the opening of perforation. We treat the neural flow by medications. The restoration of flow in LED. Yeah. Uh, this was the final data. The patient transferred to CCU with accepted vital data, and ECG shows Q is in anterior leads, and the echo shows mild to moderate pericardial effusion, not tamponading and not, not severe. The CCU data at the fifth patient, the, the fifth day, the patient uh, we leave we uh, wind the enotropes, and at the thirteenth day, mechanical ventilation was wind at the as the patient developed a high uh, form of MRSA in these days, which treated medically, and the patient discharged it safely to home and prepared for the next. The key learning from this case, primary BCI requires careful management of the patient past, but with rapid decisions. Flexibility with, of decisions and the plans must be present to get solutions for different situations. And thank you. Um, great case. Um, Mauricio, do you have any, any comments about um, how you might manage this? Is it, would, it have, would there ever be a situation, for example, where um, one would actually just let the artery stay occluded because of a, a concern of delivery of a covered stent, for example. To manage, a, yeah, yeah, to manage a, a perforation, um, obviously the first thing that I can think about is go through. You know, you have to pull up all these algorithms in your in your in your mind. Um, Never pull the wire, and, and as soon as, if you have a question, just inflate the balloon there. And, uh, and, and then that will give your, you know, give time to think, and get the echocardiographer in the room, just in case, and have that, have everything ready. And, uh, and then, uh, you know, after a prolonged inflation, as long as the patient is stable, you can, um, you, you can wait with the balloon inflated as long as you can. Now there's a new technology. I mean, we can talk about that new technology. Um, and, and reassess whether or not the, per, you know, the perforation is free flowing into the, into the pericardium. If that's the case, uh, then you have to do something. Uh, you have to probably um, use, uh, I mean, if it's a side perforation because of the stent, then you have to put another covered stent. If it's not, if it's terminal perforation, you can use a little bit of fat from the groin or you can use platelets, uh, you can use a little bit of, uh, you can use a coil um, to, to treat the perforation. Um, that's, uh, I mean, that, that's, that's a way that I, that, I, that I see it. And then be ready uh, to, to do a pericardial synthesis if the, patient, if the patient gets unstable. So I never revert the anticoagulation. Uh, I used to. And that's what the old algorithm said, but now you have a stent, you have lots of prothrombotic stuff, and then the worst thing is going from a bleed to an acute thrombotic situation that is even more difficult to handle. But we didn't, uh, we didn't reverse anticoagulation in our case. The patient developed no reflow due to balloon inflation, not reversal of anticoagulation. You didn't reverse anticoagulation. No, no, no. No, no, no. The reversal no, of anticoagulation reverse is the last anticoagulation. step of algorithm. Yeah. We didn't use it. Yeah, you don't want to reverse anticoagulation. Yeah, correct. Yeah, yeah. yeah I think he was just making that. That is a good thing to not do is to, to reverse. Um, thinking, thank you, Mauricio. Think, thinking about the cause of this perforation in the first place, um, and you'd have to bring up your original angiogram, but that was that the culprit lesion or distal to the culprit lesion? The side uh, of rupture. The LED shows multiple uh, tight lesions. Yeah. We didn't know uh, which of the culprit. Yes. Which one of them of the, is the culprit? In in hindsight, and these are always harder cases in STEMI, of course, with the emergencies and the arrests. But um, in hindsight, what do you think about the value of uh, imaging in that situation? Uh, if you had seen severe calcification of that distal lesion, would that have changed your approach? To but the it lesion? didn't available at the same time. Got it. Yep. It's, and this is where you know we, we obviously hope that as the you know kind of world embraces intravascular imaging more and it disseminates that yes. the uh, the ability to size and modify 
these lesions. Of course, very hard to expect in the setting of a STEMI, but yeah, yeah. they're going to happen. Um, this was obviously diffuse. Yeah, sure. um, so, you know, imaging when available will definitely be helpful in these types of situations. The, the second part I just wondered is, um, what did you think the initial flow rate was when you took the diagnostic angiogram? Uh, what? What was the TIMI flow rate when the first uh, angiogram was taken? TIMI 2. TIMI 2. Um, did, uh, given the severity of the three vessel disease, was there any discussion about um, cardiac surgery at that time? And about yeah, stabilizing him enough to go to cardiac surgery? The patient had about eight, of, eight cycles of uh, sustained VT and receives multiple DC shocks and medications. Too unstable. So we must uh, revascularize this uh, lesion. Great. Any other comments from the panel? Or, sir, do you have something, sir? Good. I was going to ask that. But yeah. Okay, super. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Thank we you appreciate so much. it. Thank you. Okay, our next presenter is Dr. Catherine Lutz. She is a cardiology fellow from the University of Oregon. And as I mentioned, ducks are welcome to uh, UT country. And uh, you are going to present to us broken not bent. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me here. I don't have any disclosures. Um, so our case starts with a 72-year-old female who came from an outside emergency department with NSTEMI and transferred to OHSU for further intervention, mainly because in the past she had um, several, several stents placed in her RCA and they wanted a higher level of care. Um, so most recently, she had two stents placed in her um, proximate RCA in 2020, and then unfortunately had about three months prior to presentation uh, instant restenosis of the RCA requiring lithotripsy. Um, so these are her relevant comorbidities. Here's her uh, initial coronary angiogram. What we can see here before uh, pre-intervention is that there's a very severe uh, stenosis in the, in the previously placed stent. Um, which on IVIS had about 360 degrees of calcium. We ended up doing laser atherectomy and, um, and placed a 4 by 30 resolute on, on extent with a, with a very good result. In the interim, unfortunately, after the, over the next several months, she developed a couple of other end stemmies and um, subsequently, again, unstable angina. And she had, again, instant restenosis of the mid-RCA and was transferred back to us for, for further management of the RCA. Okay, and so um, now on the repeat coronary angiogram, we can see that there's severe stenosis there, as well as what appears to be vascular injury. Um, and it might be a little bit hard uh, to see on this projection, but there is concern that there is stent discontinuity or stent fracture at the, um, at the site of the stenosis, which was subsequently confirmed by IVIS here. So we can see on the pullback that there's stenosis, and then at the bottom right side, uh, there's the the aneurysmal segment as well as discontinuity of, of the stent. And so um, we had to decide what we were going to do. She's already got now four layers of stent in this area. Uh, and so we can't really just balloon this and leave it alone. So uh, we did need to place another stent there. We could just go with a, a similar stent to what she had before, like a resolutonic stent, but we ended up deciding to place a stent with, with larger stent struts. Um, we went with the, the uh, Synergy Megatron stent so that we could have a little bit um, more of, of radial strength on that to prevent stent fracture in the future. Uh, this is the stent placement on the, on the right and then on the, uh, or on the left, and then on the right we, we use stent boost to take a look at the stent, and we can see pretty clearly here that, the, that there's a significant stent fracture and that the stent that we, that we put in there is pretty well opposed. This is our final angiographic result. We have good TIMI3 flow, uh, and there is still that same um, uh, vascular injury that's present, but it appeared stable to us from before. Uh, so there's a couple questions that I had resulting from this case. Uh, one is, um, you know, are there any management guidelines for this? There's, meta, there's, uh, there's been meta-analyses of this showing that there's only about 3 to 7 percent incidence of this, and, um, and I was curious to see if, uh, if there were any guidelines or algorithms that have been proposed in the past. And number two, what should we do if we come across a, a stent fracture that doesn't have stenosis in it? Is there a recommendation to just leave it alone or, or to do anything with that? This has been looked at in the past by, uh, by another group. Uh, they used about 4,000 patients that they did PCI in and then re-angiogrammed them 6 to 12 months later. Uh, on the left-hand side, we can see that the patients um, 
The black bars represent the patients who had stent fracture, and there are significantly higher rates of stenosis as well as um, target lesion revascularization. On the right-hand side, we can see that uh, the patients had, with, uh, with stent fracture and stenosis had lower rates of, um, of Canadian class anginal scores compared to those uh, either without stent fracture or with stent fracture who did not have stenosis present, which suggests that you know, potentially the patients who um, have stent fracture without, without stenosis, potentially we could leave that alone. So um, another group took a look at this as well and had similar results, and uh, they proposed a management algorithm. Uh, if we start at the top and look at if the patients have angina or not, uh, if we go on the left-hand side, if there's no angina, if there's no um, significant stenosis, they actually recommend just continuing medical therapy. Whereas if there, if there is angina and if there is stenosis, placing a stent uh, may be the, the preferred management here. So key learning points that, that I took away from this case are that IVIS and stent boost can help to visualize stent fracture, and this is probably an under-recognized uh, cause of instant restenosis. Risk factors that our patient had, um, pretty much everything here, are right coronary artery location, long stent placement in the past, and a lot of layers of stent. And really, there's no definitive guidelines on management, but um, kind of based on the prior studies, you know, we could consider medical, medically managing patients who don't have stenoses and, um, and a stent placement if there is. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, you know, restenosis is still our, an incredible Achilles heel, and um, especially in dialysis patients and patients with diabetes and, and so forth. Um, might just um, ask uh, um, from the panel, and we definitely have an internationally oriented panel, um, the use of, um, uh, for example, drug-coated balloons and brachytherapy, um, was that considered for you by any chance in, in these situations? Um, this is a particular case of stent fracture, so restenting is appropriate, but given all of her prior ISR history, is that something that had been Yeah, embraced? so it, it could have potentially been done, and I read a, a case report where it had been done, but I think given that they had, the patient had vascular injury as well as stenosis there, we felt that we needed to place a stent, but it has been done with good result in the past, so I think it's a reasonable option. Does anybody, uh, in, in, again, in this case, um, what, what do you think caused the ulcer? I'm just curious. Yeah, um, so I think likely what happened was the stent fractured, and then um, that resulted in, in vascular injury and potentially hematoma formation, which probably resulted in that aneurysmal formation at the, at the site. It looked like a pseudoaneurysm to me, and then it was not completely sealed. Uh, it looks like it's, uh, they, were, they looked like pseudoaneurysms to me, probably because of uh, the struts vessel injury and micro perforations and sealing rather than an ulcer and a crater. I mean, that's obviously my, what, what, what I thought first. Um, um, I think that's a great, both of those are um, s similar mechanisms. Do you think, um, do you, without knowing the details of the laser, do you think this could be subacute vessel wall injury and positive remodeling injury that you might have had two things happening? Not that the treatment would have changed, but just on a mechanism standpoint, the um, you know the laser can obviously create a, a larger bubble beyond the actual vessel lumen. Yeah, I think absolutely. Um, I think it could be certainly a combination of several things. She'd had laser therapy, lithotripsy in that area too, and um, I think I think definitely there's a couple of different things in, in play. How soon after the stenting she came back with that? Uh, yeah, it was about eight months. Yeah, so it's, it's very soon for knee atherosclerosis or, or plaque rupture or something like that. Mm -hmm. Has to be some type of injury to the vessel. Yeah. Yep, and I think your IVUS did not show a great deal of new intima when we were looking through that. Um, uh, I, I think it really also you know, it reinforces the point that when we put stents in, we got to do the best job we can up front and make sure that things are maximally expanded. And this really often requires image guidance, especially before a second layer of metal for DS. Once a third layer is in, the ability to keep it open is really quite limited. So um, um, I assume that um, cabbage is probably not an option for her with uh, her for comorbidities. But yeah, I don't think so. She, she had way too many comorbidities, and she also has MR, too, which I didn't put in this presentation, but she'd been declined for mitral valve surgery as well, so unlikely she would be a cabbage candidate either.
Interestingly, you know, th this stent fracture was from multiple layers of stent. So there is a lot of metal there that yeah. actually, uh, you know, uh, broke. And this is the first time that stent fracture has been documented in this three or four layers of stent, right? Yes, correct. I've certainly seen it, but it's pretty remarkable mm -hmm. that, you know, this has fractured despite multiple layers of uh, metal, uh, maybe from just from cardiac motion. Mm -hmm. uh, but yes, I mean, injury from uh, laser uh, uh, and particularly, I don't know if the laser was done with contrast, like sometimes we do for instant restenosis. That may have contributed to it, but it's it's pretty remarkable. I've seen it definitely with single layer of stent, but seeing it in multiple layers is pretty unique that I've seen. Yeah, yeah. I think I think most likely uh, from from what I think the mechanism is is that there were lots of layers of stent, and the right coronary artery because of hinge motion probably resulted in that in that breaking. And with the multiple layers, it was probably didn't allow the right coronary artery to to move very well. So I think that kind of caused the break. It's a great mechanism. I think you know hopefully um, in the next year we'll have a DCB that's approved and will give us the ability to avoid multiple layers of caged metal. Mm -hmm. um, just in the audience, I'm just curious, has anybody referred their patient for brachytherapy for restenosis? Wow, okay, how about on the panel? Okay, really interesting, I and mean, we, we have a brachytherapy program. We started about five years ago for all of this complex restenosis works because we have to tackle many more surgical turndowns and difficult milieus, and so um, it's, it's really interesting. I expect that will, indication will diminish with the DCBs, mm -hmm. um, but that's certainly, you know, while it's struggled sometimes to find centers nearby, that can also be, it's very effective for um, a decent number of patients. Interesting, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, What's that? That's a good point. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much. Um, okay. So uh, thank you, Dr. Lutz. Dr. Humail Patel, he's a resident at North Shore Hospital in East Rockaway, New York. On a personal note, I had a daughter born at North Shore when I was a resident at Mount Sinai. So we look forward to your talk, which will be Therox supersaturated Oxygen therapy for inferior wall MI. All right. Thank you guys for having me. Um, I'm uh, excited to be able to present our case uh, on the first application uh, of the Therox supersaturated oxygen therapy for uh, an inferior wall MI. Uh, okay. So the case itself is relatively straightforward. It's a 61 year old gentleman with hypertension who essentially presented for chest pain for uh, with chest pain for five hours. Um, had ECG evidence of an inferior MI, uh, was taken emergently to the cardiac cath lab, uh, where he was found to have two lesions. Uh, the culprit lesion uh, was a 95% uh, RCA lesion, as seen on your left, uh, as well as a 80% uh, um, lesion at the, uh, the, the bifurcation of the LED in the first diag. Um, at this point, our center had already adopted um, using supersaturated oxygen therapy uh, post PCI uh, for uh, anterior wall stemies, as indicated. Um, you know, but the question basically was, can we apply this uh, therapy and technology to inferior STEMI patients? Um, and secondly, what's the best approach for a stage PCA of the non-culprit lesion? Uh, and so we'll kind of get to that. Um, you know, in this case, the patient had a uh, placement of a stent in the RCA, uh, did end up receiving 60 minutes of, of, of uh, Therox supersaturated oxygen delivery via the RCA. Um, this is the first time that's been done. Um, the FDA approval regarding Therox in the anterior wall STEMI population is, regard, uh, is based upon the degree of infarct size associated with those infarcts. And so if a patient has a large infarct of other myocardial t uh, territories, then the thought process is that maybe it may serve some benefit as well. Um, the patient did have uh, an injection fraction of 40% post pr procedure. He was then sent to the CICU for monitoring overnight. Uh, and then it was brought back the next day for a stage PCI of the LAD and, and first diag bifurcation lesion, uh, which was done um, via the DK crush technique. Um, and kind of just going back to touch base of uh, kind of the, the background behind this, um, we know that post STEMI patients, um, you know, the, the, the degree of a prognosis and all that is, is based upon infarct size. Uh, we know that despite PCI, uh, about a quarter of patients still have about 30% of their uh, LV that remains infarcted, and that correlates directly with heart failure, hospitalizations, and mortality. 
Um, and um, this is with PCI, and so the thought process is maybe, you know, just revascularization is not enough, and there may be some role to target the microvasculature, and that's where kind of the, the supersaturated oxygen therapy comes in. Um, so the indication right now, um, it's uh, for STEMI patients undergoing primary PCI for an uh, anterior wall STEMIs um, after PCI of the LAD, uh, and typically an acute presentation within six hours of symptom onset. Um, the mechanism of action is kind of what we alluded to in the sense that these patients, um, you know, despite having PCI, their, their microvasculature can remain, uh, uh, you know, ridden with endothelial edema, uh, neutrophils, and other inflammatory debris. And so uh, hyperoxemic uh, blood delivered back into that uh, infarcted myocardium uh, may relieve some of that swelling and improve microvasculature flow. Um, We've seen in a, a few trials at this point that this therapy seems to be effective uh, and safe uh, in reducing infarct size. And then the next question would be, you know, the, the next conclusion would be if it has that same impact on, on heart failure and mortality. Uh, and we know that one in five STEMI patients do develop heart failure um, despite PCI. And so this um, looks quite promising, albeit a quite, a quite a small sample size that we have about a 20 fold reduction um, in heart failure uh, development in these patients. Um, We've seen similar results uh, after FDA approval in 2019 across different uh, centers throughout the country. Uh, this is a little dated, so we do have more data to add to this, but it looks like um, it's corroborated what we uh, kind of just discussed in that uh, the supersaturated oxygen therapy in addition to PCI uh, seems to have a, a pretty good impact on preserving the, the uh, left ventricular function in these post stemi patients. Um, just tying it back to our center's experience, just, which is not included in that graph, so over the past year, we've done nine cases. Uh, eight have been as indicated for the anterior wall STEMIs. One, which is this one, is the inferior wall STEMI case. Um, only four patients so far have had our kind of benchmark 90-day follow-up echo, so this is quite limited data. But from what we have seen, it looks like it does seem to be fitting in line with the previous data that we've seen across different uh, centers throughout the country uh, in that we do have a significant relative improvement in uh, left ventricular ejection fraction in patients receiving supersaturated oxygen in addition to PCI alone. Uh, going back to our patient, um, we've seen, uh, we have not yet had that 90-day uh, echo, so we can't really comment too much. Um, but clinically, he's doing well. It uh, remains out, uh, without any cl clinical evidence of heart failure. Uh, his pre-discharge echo was stable uh, at 41%. Um, and just to kind of summarize and tie things together, uh, we know that one in five STEMI patients uh, will develop heart failure. Um, we know that SSO2 therapy uh, has shown to have a, a reduction in infarct size, reduced heart failure hospitalizations, and ultimately mortality. Um, but we don't know if it has that impact in inferior wall patients. Uh, and so this might be indicated given the degree of infarct size. Um, and the, you know, if a large infarct, it, it may have some benefit in that as well. But of course, very minimal data and much to be learned. Thank you. Thanks for presenting this interesting case. Um, any comments from the panel? Is, is anybody using supersaturated oxygen, supersaturated oxygen in their STEMI patients? I want to say I, I, I just can't make much of an opinion. What about uh, you guys? I'm not aware of any sites in New England um, uh, that have embraced it. Clearly, the trial is there, but um, another comment from the audience. So we typically provide about 60 minutes after 60 minutes of the uh, of supersaturated oxygen uh, after stenting. Femoral. It ha so it has to be femoral. So central femoral venous access. Uh, so the case was done with uh, a six French. It had to be exchanged for a seven French for the for the catheter. I'm sorry. In all cases. Oh, do you, do all you cases. recommend it? Yeah. Do you recommend it for selected cases or for all STEMI? I, I think right now we've seen benefit in all anterior wall STEMI patients as long as they present within you know six hours of symptom onset and we do get good flow um, with revascularization. I'm not aware of its um, kind of ACCHA indication class. I, uh, I think one of the moving targets when kind of the pivotal data was done was the use of uh, GDMT and potent DAPT mm -hmm. has really evolved. And um, right. in your current approach, this is observationalized, not randomized between right. so forth. So we'll, we'll, um, we won't know for sure, but it's definitely intriguing. You know, it's actually biologically kind of interesting because usually hyperoxia is associated with more ischemia reperfusion injury. 
So it's kind of paradoxical. I don't understand all the mechanisms of why that works. Um, but there's clearly this massive unmet need. Like uh, in our prior cases today, we saw no reflow. And we know those patients are going to have tremendous infarcts. We really need to be able to handle, have something beyond just primary PCI. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that part's interesting. Any other comments? Yeah, so there is a randomized trial ongoing. Actually, we're part of the trial. And as you know, when they tested uh, supersaturated oxygen just to evaluate the infarct size, it's extremely difficult to enroll. And their enrollment has been slow. Hopefully, we can answer that in the next few years. But uh, we have enrolled a couple of patients, yeah. Uh, to your point, it does add uh, about an hour of uh, lab time, whereas if you are going radial, then you'd need a groin, separate groin access. If you are going groin, then you have to upside to seven friend system so that you can deliver supersaturated oxygen. So it, it is a little cumbersome. Uh, obviously, two in the morning, staff are going to hate you, uh, but um, uh, if but we will, ha I think we'll have answer whether it actually matters clinically or not in next few years. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thanks so much. Okay, thank you, Dr. Patel. Our next speaker uh, will be Milan Ravi Shankar. He is a cardiology fellow uh, uh, at uh, Baylor. University Medical Center in downtown Dallas. On another personal note, uh, I was a fellow there 42 years ago. So nice to hear from somebody at my alma mater. Ravi, and you're going to speak to us today about a blocking balloon technique to rescue stent balloon rupture, which is caused in acute stent closure and thrombosis. Yeah. Thank you for having me. And I'd like to thank Dr. Chug as well for his uh, guidance in uh, helping me present this case. And so our, our case starts with a 25-year-old gentleman who has no prior cardiac history or cardiac symptoms, but he does have daily electronic cigarette use and no family history of premature CAD, who starts to have chest pressure at home while at rest. And when the symptoms don't go away, he presents to the ER the initial 12-lead EKG shows a STEMI in the inferior leads, and so he's taken for emergent coronary angiography. A right radial artery approach was taken, and the first artery that was visualized was the right coronary artery, and that was angiographically normal. On the left side, a 3-5 EBU was used to visualize uh, the left system, and there was a 100% occlusion of the proximal left circ. And so the initial angioplasty uh, starts out smoothly, an Asahi soft wire is used and it easily crosses the lesion, uh, non-compliant balloon inflated at the lesion site, ST segment elevation resolves and the patient's symptoms improve. So to begin uh, the plan for stent delivery, a buddy wire is placed in the adjacent ramus artery and a 3-5 by 22 onyx frontier is delivered to the lesion site and was inflated to 14 atmospheres. And of note, the rated burst pressure for this stent balloon is 16 atmospheres. And at this time, the operators notice that it's difficult to uh, deliver additional pressure to the stent balloon. And angiography is performed. And we can see that the stent is only partially expanding proximally and not expanding at all distally. On top of that, with additional uh, delivery of contrast into the balloon, we see contrast going into the distal vessel. And this uh, confirms our suspicion that a stent balloon rupture has occurred. And so at this point, the trajectory of the case has changed now because we have this additional uh, hardware complication that we need to deal with. The patient's chest pain has resumed and the ST segment uh, elevation has returned. And so the first thing that was attempted was to just remove the ruptured stent balloon, leaving the partially deployed stent in place. The challenge that came with this is that as the stent balloon was being pulled back, the partially deployed stent was also being pulled back with it. And so you can see it's now more proximal and it's up to the circumflex ostium. And so there was the, that buddy wire in place in the ramus, and so a blocking balloon approach was taken where a non-compliant balloon was deployed to the ostium of the left circumflex, and it allowed us to pull back on that ruptured stent balloon without 
bringing the partially deployed stent forward anymore. And so you can see that happening in this slide, uh, if you can see the markers, that the stent balloon is successfully removed. So after that was done, uh, they were, we were able to use a non-compliant balloon uh, and complete the expansion of the partially deployed stent. Uh, this IVIS imaging just confirms that the stent is well, well opposed to a soft plaque and that even though the stent was partially deployed and then it was moved proximally, it was still long enough to cover the lesion and so we didn't need to place any additional stents uh, distal to uh, distal to the first stent. It also shows us that this vessel is not heavily calcified. And so ultimately we, there was a good result with Timmy 3 flow and you can see the, the stent and the complete flow in the left circumflex. This is a, a picture of that uh, stent balloon that was removed from the patient and you can see it's being filled with water and there's a jet stream of water coming out the top of the balloon at 12 o'clock, and so you can see that pinhole rupture uh, that happened. And so learning points for this case are that stent balloon ruptures are an infrequent complication, but they're, they are something that should be anticipated, and they'll happen during angioplasty, primarily from heavily calcified lesions or high pressure inflation, but also if there's a manufacturing defect. Uh, contrast streaming from ruptured balloons can cause coronary dissection or perforation as well as air embolization. And that a blocking balloon technique is a, a viable approach to prevent proximal stent migration if you have to remove that balloon. Great, thank you so much. Really interesting. I not, have not personally seen that employed that way. I, I think that was really um, quite fascinating. Um, any uh, comments about the, the um, the use of that um, balloon, have you, has that ever been done in any of the prior cases that you know about? Or? So it was interesting when it happened, the, the attending who recommended that approach has, has been in practice for many years and he said he's only seen it one time in, in his career, which I don't want to put a number on it, but it's <laughs> <laughs> expansive. Gary, you want to comment on that? Well, it's interesting that uh, it's an interesting technique and uh, I, I would like to ask you who that person was, but that's okay. You don't have to divulge <laughs> that information. Yeah. But <clears throat> we often will use a similar technique to make sure that on a very proximal stent deployment where it actually abuts the ostium, often we will put a blocking balloon into the vessel and pull back until the stent, that proximal strut of the stent, abuts the, uh, the blocking stent, thereby sort of ensuring that you have covered uh, plaque all the way up to the ostium. So this is just another manifestation of that technique. I think it's interesting. It's an elegant and uh, little case and with a nice result. Anybody? Congratulations. The first thing that came to my mind was uh, if I was in, in your shoes, which is not easy uh, with that complication in, a, in such a young uh, person, uh, would be to put a guideliner probably and use a guideliner just to hold onto the stand while you pull the while you pull back the balloon. That's what would, I mean. That's how it, I would have probably reacted to that complication. But again, everybody reacts uh, differently. And it's always when we discuss complications, it's easy to be the Monday, the Monday morning quarterback. But why would you put the guideliner if you've already have the balloon shot? Well, you yeah, can cut, you gotta, you you gotta can cut, cut it. The, you can cut the, yeah, you can cut Just the like the rota, like in trap rotas. Yeah. Just like in trap burrs. That's yeah. a really, it's a great suggestion as well. Um, is that, is that? Because the, the, the guideliner, the, the borders of the guideliner, uh, the rim would have uh, engaged with the part of the stand that is already deployed and hold the stent in place and allow you to pull the balloon that is uh, under the floor. Yeah, so it's a, it's a great technique for those who haven't, you, haven't employed uh, it. Did you pre-dilate? Yes, uh, when the, the angioplasty was performed, that's when the ST segments resolved and uh, so there, there was res restoration. What, what was the size of the pre-dilation balloon and did you IVIS it based on which you s 
use this stent size? So uh, IBIS was used uh, after the, the initial balloon angioplasty. That confirmed also that it was not a heavily calcified lesion, and, and the sizing was based off of that. The, um, so and I the believe the non-compliant balloon we started with was a 3.5 or, or 3.0. That was your pre dill Yeah. Was a non-compliant yes. three five. Yeah. Or three zero. Okay. The uh, you know the, the challenge with the guideliner in this particular case is that you could also deform the stent on the guideliner as it gets pulled back. So it is a it is there's no easy solution. But um, two things that I just you know wondered if you thought about during this time is is obviously two things that are possible. One is to actually just so you had some dilatation. If you could advance that balloon just slightly so that you can even get two to four ats. You have to do this with very low pressure. You have a pinhole, so you certainly can't go high pressure. Mm -hmm. But maybe that would give you a little bit of distal expansion to free up the balloon and then go down. Mm -hmm. If there was any way before pulling back to just see if the balloon, because pulling the stamp back into the left main is obviously much more complicated. Did, was that considered at all? Did you manipulate the balloon trying to go distal? No, I, I think once we saw that the, no, we, we didn't try to manipulate distally. Once we saw that it was moving backwards, we wanted a different approach to get it out. And I think your approach was, you know, definitely much more simplified and elegant, and it worked great. But the other possibility is to consider, did you consider a second access and trying to bring a second wire down and just gently bringing in small balloons or microcatheters to somehow create another finesse plane? In that, this case, it wasn't considered, and I think part of it is that the symptoms returned and the ST segment elevation that we previously saw had also returned. and. I think we, it was felt this would be a faster approach. Really great. Milan, I'm interested in this, the lipid profile on this patient who presents with a STEMI at the age of 25. Yeah, so a, a lipid panel was taken after this. His LDL at the time was 123. Other, you know, he wasn't, uh, he didn't have high triglycerides. Lipoprotein A was within normal limits. He, you know, he, he's had follow-up with us months later I think he's on a full family history at this point. There's one great aunt who had an MI in her 20s. That's it. Yeah. No, stim no stimulants on the UDS, just the daily uh, electronic cigarette use. Non-smoker? He, he is a non-smoker, but he does, has okay. daily electronics, daily vaping. Oh, daily vaping. Yeah. Whoa. Yeah. So I, find I find these cases completely fascinating. Like, shows you how much we don't understand. Um, last comment I was going to make. Um, it obviously depends on the size of a hole, uh, but what you want to do, something like that happens, is try to aspirate all the contrast, make sure no air bubbles, and try to basically uh, go a little faster on inflator. If a hole is not big, sometimes you can get up to like eight atmosphere. That's when you usually need like to release the stent stress, and you can always take a smaller balloon and then uh, post deal. Uh, but what you want, there is always a concern for dissection, and obviously you have to be aware of that. But with the six to eight atmosphere, you're probably not going to get that. Um, and the main concern is air embolization and losing flow distally. So you do want to make sure going multiple negatives that there are no air bubbles when you try that technique. Sometimes it works, but obviously it depends on the size of the hole, whether you can go faster than the actual leak is or not. Great comment. Thank you. Good. All right, thank, thank you, you so much. Me. Great case, thank you. Okay, that was, uh, that was, uh, was interesting. Um, Dr. Kopstein did not make it, so we will move on to uh, Dr. Ahmad Abdelhamid. He is an MD, PhD. He is an associate consultant at Aswan Heart Center in Cairo, Egypt. Thank you for coming so far. Thank you. We will listen uh, intently to your case. Thank you for having me. Uh, my case is titled Paving the Way for the Tough Job, Retrograde PCI for an RCA CTO in a post cabbage patient. Uh, I have nothing to disclose. Uh, my patient was a 73 years male patient, diabetic, hypertensive, ischemic he heart disease. Um, his history was relevant for cabbage in 2010 with Lima to LED, SVG to PDA, and SVG to OM2. Through 2016 to 2018, he had recurrent acute coronary syndromes. Most of them were uh, troponin negative. Uh, and most importantly, that he uh, had his SVG to PDA um, totally occluded. And so he had PCI to RCA-CTO native um, and proximal uh, LCX. 
In 2020, he presented again with unstable angina, had PCI to D2, and found that uh, he has total occlusion of uh, the RCA instant that failed uh, to be recanalized anti-gradely. Uh, also, he is a myopathic patient with ejection fraction 30%, no uh, uh, regions of uh, echinesia or thin out, um, suggesting all viable myocardium with permanent atrial fibrillation on DOEX and uh, CKD with EGFR of 42. He presented to us uh, after that long history in December 2022 with an NST uh, elevation myocardial infarction, pulmonary edema, severe functional mitral regurg, and rapid atrial fibrillation. Um, we started the coronary angiogram via left ulnar. That was the lima, um, good lima, but to a diffusely diseased LAD. That was the right coronary instant CDO. I'm sorry, uh, someone has to um, stop trying to connect to the uh, TV. Okay. Too shiny. Sure. <laughs> uh, the right coronary has uh, the two RV branches over the distal cap, but the um, RTA is totally occluded from the mid segment. Uh, and this is uh, the native left system. Uh, thank you. The native left system with um, um, a severe subtotal occlusion into the first diagonal artery and um, severe um, diffuse lung stenosis in the all the branches of uh, the LCX. Um, uh, because we have his prior angiograms, uh, we realized that the RCA is the most sizable vessel among all these, but it is CTO with the previous failure two years ago. Uh, we know that the new lesion is the subtotal occlusion uh, of the diagonal. And uh, the diseased LCX are the potential retrograde routes to recanalize the RCA. So we advanced a stabilizing wire into the D2 that has the bit instant. Uh, we started with wiring uh, the first diagonal, the presumable culprit, with a sign black wire. Um, when we tried to advance balloon, it was uh, not able to advance except after advancing a body wire into the same diagonal branch, dilated with a BTCA balloon repeatedly at different levels, and then uh, we treated it with a 2540 uh, DCB for 120 seconds. Um, actually, it behaved very acceptable to the DCP, and then uh, we thought of paving the way for the next um, um, tough procedure. So we wired the posterior uh, branch of um, uh, the LCX, and this went like a piece of cake, but uh, um, trying to wire the anterior branch, which is actually the route for the LCX collaterals, uh, was very challenging, so we had to put um, an occlusive balloon below its ostium in order to deflate, to force deflate uh, the wire uh, so it can be directed into the anterior branch. Uh, then we dilated uh, both branches, the anterior and posterior, with a short uh, 2 and 2.25 uh, drug coated balloons, and the procedure was finished with very acceptable results uh, to these. They were indeed small branches, all the branches from the circumflex, because the uh, AV trunk was trifurcating early into very small branches. None of them could have accepted stent, uh, but we have paved the way for the second procedure. In two weeks after stabilizing the patient and optimizing his condition, uh, we advanced a sign wire into the epicardial collateral. This was a tip injection through the Caravel 150. And we uh, can appreciate that uh, at the distal end of the stented segment, there was a very um, uh, tight total, subtotal occlusion, sorry. Um, um, we um, um, coursed through the CTO body with a Gaia third that was advancing nicely, um, could not advance the Caraville uh, apart from this part to uh, be able to exchange the wire. So uh, we planned to externalize the Gaia third into the guiding so we can trap it and proceed but it was always going into the aorta. Uh, so we advanced the balloon to push the amplets away a bit, and we realized that uh, uh, the stents were very protruding outside um, uh, the right coronary artery, and the amplets actually was guiding. The guiding amplets was cannulating, and the wire was entering from uh, the underneath of a side cell into the stent. This is why the Gaia was not able to make it. So we exchanged into a GR, 
uh, externalized the Gaia, trapped it. Uh, um, uh, now we have the support to advance uh, the Caravel, exchanged into an externalization RG3 wire, dilated all the way of the RCA. Um, we could not, despite having uh, an externalized wire with an excellent support, we could not advance uh, the balloons integrally uh, over that uh, um, subtotal occlusion at the runoff. So we took a piss meal with a 1.2, 1.5, then 2, and a 2.25 NC. Um, sorry, the IFAS is a bit longish, but uh, we now know uh, the mechanisms, and uh, the last image was uh, the very protruding stand outside. We treated the funneling. Um, with the guidance of the IVAS sizing, um, we post-dilated all the way by a 3.5 and a 4 non-compliant balloon. Then we treated it with a um, uh, uh, kissing balloon and a, a semi-compliant balloon at uh, the distal bifurcation, followed by three drug-coated balloons over the whole length of the right coronary artery. Uh, the IVAS, the final IVAS was very good, and this was the final angiographic picture. So the key learning uh, uh, points that we had in an anticoagulated myopathic chronic kidney disease post-cabbage patient presenting with anstemia and acute pulmonary edema, a CTO PCI should not be performed ad hoc, particularly if it was a previous failure and planning to go uh, retrograde as primary strategy through epicardial collaterals. Preparing the LCX branches during the anstemia uh, was a handy pavement required for the suspected, uh, the subsequent challenging procedure, paying all the time and effort to understand, to understand why I am unable to is the fastest key to defeat an obstacle. And thank you. Great, thank you so much. It's here. Um, really good technical case. Um, this is um, the very much the nature of post-cabbage um, patients, um, really diffuse calcific coronary disease with ISR. Um, how come you did not start Anagrade? Because I needed to minimize my contrast, and I appreciate that the previous operator two years ago who failed anti gradely was a very good operator. So I liked to start from where he ends. Did not want to consume a lot of contrast trying anti grade and then um, um, getting into the same point because uh, after, actually, after uh, losing a lot of contrast in a CKD patient. Um, the uh, proximal cap was on a trifurcation, and uh, the mode of failure was essentially that all the equipment were deviating into any of the RV branches, unable to penetrate the uh, proximal cap inside the stent. Um, actually, the main reason was respecting the previous failure of the right coronary anti-gradely. Comments? What size was your guide uh, in the, was it a six French seven. GR4? Seven, seven French, French. GR4. Okay. Uh, starting with seven French AL, uh, then uh, converting into seven French GR. You did a beautiful job with the, the reason on the anti-grade part and, and also just while we can have super senior operators have tried certain things and so forth, you know, you have to always weigh the risk and benefit of an epicardial cross. This was a, a good one. It was sizable and not super tortuous, um, which was great. What, uh, what's your strategy? If, that, if there had actually been collateral injury with perforation, how would you have managed that? Uh, <laughs> um, I guess um, I sh should have coiled it, but coiling it would um, block the way for any subsequent attempts to go retrograde. But the good thing that they were two of uh, epicardial collaterals. Uh, both of them were coming from the same branch, from the LCX. Both of them were uh, getting into the uh, uh, PLV of the right coronary artery. So I started with the smoother and less tortuous one. Um, in, in if things went south, the first thing was uh, to block it with uh, a balloon and uh, coil it. Yep, so coiling is definitely the right Right approach, and often you might not discover the perforation until you've actually successfully fixed the total occlusion itself, and then when you withdraw the microcatheter, some of those kind of um, s holes are now more apparent. Yes. Um, obviously important to keep a wire and, and coil on, which side do you coil on, one side, distal or proximal, or both when you are going to coil a collateral that's injured like that? Usually we start to coil at the side of uh, occlusion, and for safety I go for uh, one extra coil proximal. 
Yep. So you usually want to control both ways, distal and proximal as well. Yes. It, Yes. Yes, certainly, but this comes at the cost of um, unguaranteed success of occlusion. And this patient was really fragile. Um, any extra complication or adverse event would have shocked him strongly. It's a pretty big, pretty big collateral for fat, um, so it might be might be hard. But it definitely, there's there's lots of options that are less um, permanent, it's such certain, as certain. you know blood cells that were mentioned by Mauricio and uh, thrombin and gel foam and all sorts of things. But um, it's a good case. I would just make the point that anagrade trying with a directed wire, such as a Gaia three and a Stato twenty, you could probably make proximal cap penetration, which is all you needed to do to start anagrade. You may not cross. You may still get stuck. Great to have the retrograde support. Um, but because the stent is defining the architecture, you wouldn't actually have to use a lot of contrast as well, but just as a side, side comment, but nice job. Thank you. All right, yeah, great. Can I Thank just you. make a couple of comments? Sorry, uh, one more comment? Yep. Yeah, so the, yeah, you, to your comment that it's too big, even a small, uh, this is post cavus epicardial going through the circular PLV, if that collateral bleeds, this patient gonna die. So I think you have to absolutely make sure that you seal the bleeding and fat. You can try it, but it's not very predictable. So the coils, I think they, they I completely changed my practice. I only coil, use coils to for a small vessel puff. It's so easy to, to do and, and very predictable, uh, especially the collateral like this. If they bleed and the patient just gonna pass this, this is, I didn't think oh, we can take that. Um, um, not seriously at all. So, and then also it's important you coil both sides. The other thing that the epicardial perforation happens mostly after we externalize when just to, to and fro movement of the uh, externalized wires. So there is a train towards like converting integrate early. After crossing, I would have probably just converted integrate early and then um, I know you had a lot of difficulty delivering balloon and stents and then just figure it out. I think that would have been a safer way to do it. Uh, when you convert integrate, uh, obviously you wanna make sure that there is no epicardial collateral perforation. So you take microcatheter from both sides, do a uh, tip injection from both sides, no perforation. If there is a perforation, you deal with perforation and then the stent later. Uh, but I think the, uh, I stop externalizing uh, anytime I do epicardial collaterals, uh, mostly just like either tip in or like convert indicator early. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Thank you for the comment. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me here. Uh, thank you, Abdel Hamid. Um, a scheduled um, presentation, but we are going to come back to the very first one. Uh, Dr. Uh, Adouer was not available, and uh, but he is here now, so he's going to uh, present to us um, uh, first incident of acute ACS STEMI in uh, in a sick, in an 85-year-old who had a previous CVA. Oh, thank you for having me. Um, this is a slight detour from what you were hearing. Uh, I'll be presenting from the emergency department perspective and from across the Atlantic. Uh, my background is in medicine, medicine and um, a practice in the United Kingdom. I'm sorry I was in the wrong salon earlier on. Um, um, my case is the first incident of um, ACS to my in an 85-year-old previous um, CVA. Um, I have no interest to declare. I so have to say I'm not a cardiologist, I must remind you, I'm a medicine medicine physician. Um, eight five year old gentleman, he presented with a two hour history of central chest pain. Uh, pain described as being moderate intensity, pain scores five or ten, and he had a characteristic um, symptomatic presentation, it was gripping in nature, there was no radiation, and there was no ascertainable aggravating or ameliorating factors. Patient background hypertensive, he had an ischemic CVA uh, three years prior to presentation. I uh, was currently in some antiplatelet medication, uh, HMD coverage, doctors and beaters, and then some ARBs. He was not in respiratory distress. He was peripherally well perfused. Matter of fact, he looked pretty okay. Um, as per protocol, um, the ECG done for all patients, I suppose here in the US, but um, in the UK too, um, both in the ambulance and in the ED, every patient presenting with chest pain and upper abdominal pain has an ECG done, um, EKG as you will call it. Um, showed an ST elevation in free lateral leads and a supercall as the depression in the interior leads. 
Um, the high sense troponin done on presentation is 276.1. We have an algorithm we use to access in the ED um, chest pain for every patient, and um, the heart score um, being acronym in history, ECG mean ECG findings, H, um, the risk factors and troponin was 10, and the heart score was 10. Best side of the they showed no ventricular strain. Um, sorry about that. Um, the patient presented during out of hours for the CCU slash PCI. So um, we sometimes have this, we have this integrated um, way of managing the NHS where we have different hospitals and regional cardiac centers. Might be the same here. Um, my hospital does cardiac um, interventions during hospital hours, but out of hours we have to go to a regional center. And that was a challenge for the ED perspective. We have to make a decision. Um, we do a repeat ECG when we have a suspicion, 30 minutes after presentation, no dynamic changes, the clock is ticking, what do I as an EM physician do? Because I have to have a call to cardiologist and I have to have a very strong case to advocate for a possible PCI. And all this cost of the cardiac surgeon, if I think it's surgical, all the way to London inside is gonna be a cabbage that's gonna be done. The clock is ticking, what to do? And so we made a decision based on the evaluations using the tools we have that this patient needs to go down the trajectory of the cardiologist. And so we spoke with the cardiologist emailed the ECG findings to them, and then I had to make a case. And we decided that we should immediately commence an ACS protocol. Uh, Why is by in time? Patient was administered on aspirin as the protocol, um, nitroglycerin, and then patient was already on clopidogrel, so we did have a convergent agreement with the cardiologist that we shouldn't um, add on another antiplatelet since we were already given aspirin, patient was on clopidogrel. Um, Cause was obtained, and the patient was conveyed via ambulance um, blue light to nurse cardiac center. As a matter of fact, I had to hijack the nearest available ambulance center to open up a patient to convey this patient to nurse cardiac center. Uh, patient was converted to cath cathler within an hour of presentation, and they had this PCI even 90 minutes of the presentation. Um, um, apologies, couldn't obtain the images. We had some hitch obtaining that, but on um, the underground district of triple artery disease, there was an acute thrombus in the major parts of the RCA and the atherosclerotic plaques in the second flex and the LED. Um, as per procedure, the axis was through the RRA and then had an overlapping DS at the mid to distal part of the RCA. Um, the discussion was made with the cardiothoracic surgeons should they be a cabbage because of the LED and the left second flex, but the cardiac surgeon said, no, when touching the patients at five years old, previous diabetic, um, diabetic, previous CVA, not a candidate. And so they went on with the um, PCI. Uh, patient's immediate post-procedure consideration was stable, and then he was managed for a few days afterwards. His review um, just four weeks later, uh, two months later now, has been fine. Um, this just happened two months ago, so we're still waiting six months um, reviews for protocol. Patient was stable so far. Um, the cardiologists are not too happy that he sent us a box of chocolate instead of going to the cardiologist. Uh, but so far, that's my case. Uh, thank you for listening from the ED perspective and across the Atlantic. I'm very grateful for this opportunity. Thank you. Um, if you have any cases, any questions, um, if it's too cuddly oriented, I have a panel to help you answer them. If it's EM oriented, I'm here to answer them for you. Well, thank you for this presentation. Um, it's, it's obviously an important message to you know, realize that um, as our patients get older and older, that everyone needs to be assessed individually uh, for their candidacy and to not make an ad hoc decision or a preemptive decision to not offer invasive services to people who can obviously benefit. Um, I think that the interesting part about you know the, the judgment about leaving residual left-sided coronary disease after a STEMI has been performed would go against usually standard guidelines to complete revascularization for yeah. those. So, um, did you do you think this patient will have further cardiology follow-up and a revisiting of that decision? Yeah, yeah it's so uh, it could go either way, generally speaking. But yes, there's a possibility because um, he had a triple artery disease. Um, the focus was on the RCA. Um, it still has a left side complex and um, LED um, challenges, so there's a possibility that even for the six months mark, it could still have another sequelae. Yeah, um, that's a possibility, but it's a, it's a fair trial. It's a, it's a big problem as we see our patients surviving uh, uh, procedures and, and um, interventions, they become older and older, and sometimes it's hard to know when to quit. And, um, uh, you know, these patients with significant comorbidities prior CVA, uh, um, you, you, you fixed what was broken, and then I think the strategy of stepping back and seeing what you have is very wise. And, uh, and if the patient is asymptomatic, 
doing well post-procedure uh, and now has, uh, I guess you could say, two vessel disease, but is asymptomatic and, and uh, I, I can't see why you wouldn't want to continue to treat this 85-year-old with a stroke, a prior stroke, uh, conservatively. It's, it's sometimes hard for we interventionalists to do that because we're always looking to fix things, but I think that that was a, a wise clinical decision. You can, you know, uh, revisit the issue uh, after the acute event is, is taken care of and solved. So I, you know, yeah, I, I like the way you. you handle that case. Yeah, I'll agree with you. But you also know, across the Atlantic, um, we would like to say that um, in healthcare-wise, um, America might be the home of the brave, but we in the UK are the land of the free. So the option of a free healthcare means sometimes we get overtly aggressive because patient in pain, you don't have an insurance company that's complaining, so oh, it's free, so why not go ahead? So that might be a factor to sometimes in being overtly aggressive in treatment. Um, I guess that, uh, that should do it. Um, we finished on time. Uh, yeah, we're supposed to be done at uh, about three and that's great. So we will uh, put our heads together we panelists and the moderators, and we will uh, decide um, uh, which of these uh, cases, which are all very excellent and interesting, uh, we get to pick two, and we will uh, commiserate, and we'll make a decision, and you guys will hear about that.